and I would like to welcome our audience and our guests uh, on behalf of POSOCOMES. Today, we, um, Diana Chuchus and Katarzyna steinczak -Wichlid, uh, excuse me, will discuss the book Winning Women's Hearts and Minds, Selling Cold War Culture in the US and in the USSR, written by Diana Chuchus. It's really, it's uh, correctly the name. I, I pronounce it correctly, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Diana is historian specialized in American women's and cultural history and the intersection of foreign and domestic policy with society and culture. Her research focuses on, uh, on the ways in which the US government and media politicized women, traditional gender roles and consumer culture during the early Cold War. Dr. Chuchus teaches at Toronto Metropolitan University, the University of Toronto, and the Life Institute in the areas of 20th century American foreign social and cultural policy. Uh, Katarzyna steinczak wischlitz is an assistant professor at the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences and a member of the Committee of Women's History, a section of the Polish National Historical Committee. She has a doctor grade in literary, literary, oh, excuse me, literary studies and MA in history. Her interests range from gender and woman history in post-war Poland to the history of popular culture and popular discuss analysis. And dear Katarzyna and dear Diana, the floor is yours. And we will start with a presentation of the book by Diana. Uh, thank you so much, Alina. I appreciate that kind introduction of myself and Katarzyna as well. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate um, this honor, um, essentially, of being included in the Post-Socialist and Comparative Memory Studies Seminar. Um, thank you for this invitation, and I do want to say thank you to all those who have contributed to this, including yourself, Alina, but also um, other organizers such as Anna Anastasia, uh, Daria, Marie, and of course yourself, Katarzyna, acting as a discussant. So thank you so much uh, for all of this. Uh, so today I will be discussing my book, which is called Winning Women's Hearts and Minds. You can see the backdrop image of it right here in this slide. I'll show you a better image um, afterwards. It was released uh, last year. And again, I do welcome the uh, thoughtful comments by Katarzyna, questions and any questions that you may all have yourself. And again, thank you uh, for joining today. So I will go to my first slide. I promise to not inundate you with um, slides with many words, but I did want to really show you the images that are involved in this magazine, because of course, being a magazine, images are often the most important aspect of uh, this type of uh, work or print culture in general. So in particular, today I will be discussing intersections of foreign and domestic policy and politics and culture and the ways in which the US government and media politicized women, traditional gender roles and consumer culture during the early Cold War. So I will be focusing on US cultural diplomacy in Russia through America, which is a rarely discussed, very unfortunately, Russian language Cold War era magazine that I argue did two things. First, it conveyed the American way of life to Russian women to sway them towards a supposedly superior way of life based on traditional gender roles and consumer culture. And secondly, in the process of doing this, it sought to undermine and destabilize a Soviet regime that provided few accessible and affordable consumer goods for its citizens. So why focus on a magazine? Well, my goal is to demonstrate the impact of soft power. So we consider in many cases influencers today and we typically conceive of them through social media, but I'm going to go far back in time to a bygone era and focus on the magazine. So in contrast to military or economic power, as I'm sure many of you know, soft power is the ability to shape or persuade people towards a certain way of thinking. So I'm going to focus on America, but we'll briefly discuss the Ladies Home Journal, of course, an American magazine where America's editors obtained content. 
So just for some background information, America was first published by the State Department in 1945, and its first 50,000 monthly copies sold out instantaneously. Uh, this is according to the State Department. I do want to note that my perspective does come from a westernized American perspective and United States archives. So I do welcome any of your own opinions and interpretations based on, in particular, um, possibly living um, in, in these um, uh, former Soviet socialist republics and, and possibly experiencing your own versions of these magazines because they did also exist in the Czech Republic um, or Czechoslovakia, in the former Yugoslavia and in Poland as well. So the magazine was discontinued in Russia in 1952 due to complications with its Soviet distributor censorship approval and circulation. So for example, it took months to approve articles, meaning issues were delayed. The State Department also suspected that it had been withholding or hiding issues entirely, eventually returning them to the US Embassy, claiming that they hadn't been sold. This became known within the State Department as the America Crisis. So when it was discontinued, effectively America's only method of reaching the Russian people on a sustained basis, and I want to emphasize with images, was eliminated. And I emphasize with images because the Voice of America, as we know, still existed, but you could not see those images through the radio, right? Images were very impactful, particularly if they were in color. But American efforts to reach Russians changed in July of 1955, when the Geneva summit took place between the big four leaders, and there was a lessening of tensions. So following this lessening of tensions in July of 1956, the US proposed the exchange of English and Russian language magazines in their respective nations. So the agreement began a decades long exchange of two magazines, America pictured on the left-hand side of your screen and USSR on the right-hand side of your screen. So I'd be curious to know if any of you have also perhaps seen USSR. Um, it was later renamed Soviet Life. So each side would sell 50,000 copies and neither magazine was censored. America's second run, just as with USSR, began in October of 1956 and was now published by the United States Informa Information Agency, which was established in 1953 as America's first peacetime agency devoted to spreading, quote, cultural information overseas, what we would otherwise call propaganda, but the USIA did not want to refer to it as propaganda because that was, of course, negatively associated with Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. So I focus in my book and in this presentation to an extent, mainly between the years of 1956 and 1960. And I argue that these were pivotal years for America's overseas information program for three reasons. First, it had the complete support by President Eisenhower, who was a vast proponent based on his experiences in World War II of propaganda or cultural information. It was also supported by Congress as a result. It was skillfully led, well-developed and funded. And it benefited from the quote, thaw in the US-Soviet relationship after Stalin's 1953 death. These were years where traditional gender roles and consumption were rampant throughout the magazine. When America emerged or re-emerged, the USIA had a renewed opportunity to reach Russian women, particularly since the US government was now focused on forging relationships with people and influencing their opinions rather than just interacting with governments. So America became central to the USIA's overseas cultural information program. So America, what did it look like? Well, it looked like America's most popular magazine of the time period, Life Magazine, as you can see pictured right here on the right-hand side of your screen. It was a glossy magazine filled with color images. It focused on American culture and society, but it had no editorials or advertisements because it did not want to fear aggravating the Soviet government. Historian Walter Hickson calls America, quote, polite propaganda, because it didn't include hard-hitting political news stories or critiques of the Soviet regime. There were stories, indeed, on the structure of government, the electoral process, elected officials, and the press. But for the most part, it had soft news stories, just as life did at the time. It rarely showed science and industry, but did show consumer technology, for example, cars 
and household appliances and how they improved women's lives. These articles did mainly consist of reprints from major magazines like the Ladies Home Journal. So I focus on the Ladies Home Journal because it was America's most popular women's magazine. It shaped and reflected traditional gender norms, including Betty Friedan's iconic or iconic happy housewife heroine. This white middle class, as you know, heterosexual married woman with no paid income who was a consumer. She supposedly created a loving and stable life for her family. She was content with her role as a feminine wife, mother, homemaker, and consumer. And these images contrasted those of Russian women that were presented at the time. I'm not saying that those were reality, but this is how they were presented, as I'm sure you know. So during the Cold War, a common approach for the Ladies Home Journal was to contrast the supposed freedoms and liberties of America with the Soviet Union. Women's magazines depicted the other, what historian Robert Griswold calls the graceless, shapeless, and sexless Russian woman. In other words, this unappealing image of the Russian babushka. She is hardworking, but an unhappy victim of an oppressive communist regime that gives her few privileges. She was a figure with whom American women could sympathize because they never wanted to have her life. In 1947, author John Steinbeck and photographer Robert Kappa, a Hungarian, traveled to Russia and Ukraine, which resulted in a February 1948 Ladies Home Journal extensive feature called Women and Children in Soviet Russia. And it was meant to show Americans that Russians are, quote, people too. Steinbeck and Kappa were sympathetic of the people, but critical of a totalitarian regime. Their interviews with ordinary Soviets showcased the human effects of war and communism. This cover, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, shows a Russian woman working on her hands and knees, an aging face, hands that appeared to have worked hard in their lifetime. She's dressed in peasant clothing. Images like this were used to show American women that life in the Soviet Union was difficult and that they were, quote, lucky to live in a capitalist country. So these images of the happy housewife heroine and the Russian babushka reflected and popularized mid 20th century notions of women, at least from an American or Western perspective. And I do want to emphasize that. And for many these depictions are ones which in our popular memories, at least if you're living in the West, defined American womanhood as well as the other. They also importantly and broadly show how women were used for political purposes within the cultural realm. So when the USIA relaunched America, its goal was to convey an American way of life that was supposedly superior for the babushka. In 1959, the USIA articulated that its goal was to portray the woman, the American woman, as devoted to family, womanliness, and industriousness. She should be shown as human and hardworking, a conserver of values, and possessing the almost universal feminine characteristics with which women throughout the world could identify and respect. USI officials believed that Russian women wanted to see these glossy magazines with color images. And in reading America, a Russian woman could be transported into a far off distant land, one which contained the domesticated consumer oriented lifestyle found in capitalist countries, essentially a better way of life, supposedly. Through America, the USIA could win the, quote, hearts and minds of Russian women. Now, America's first issue here, as I've already indicated, shows a little girl in red gazing before the sea, and its editors described America as a magazine about the people of the U.S., how they live, work, and play. It will try to capture their moods and aspirations, their concerns, and their light moments of relaxation, we shall attempt to portray what Americans are thinking and doing, what they are reading and saying. So this issue, issue sets the stage for how American women are portrayed in the magazine for the rest of the decade in three ways, which I'm going to discuss briefly. First, as a feminine and fashionable woman. Secondly, as a happy housewife and homemaker. And third, as a consumer. So America's editors used clothes to appeal to Russian women and their supposed desire to be more feminine. Each issue had at least one article on fashion, all of which showed tall, thin, and attractive white women wearing skirts and dresses, never pants. This contrasted with the drab, shapeless, and heavy 
clothing Russian women wore in American magazines, as you can see in this ladies' home journal on the right, which indicates a typical Russian housewife. And I don't think that Russian women would ever call themselves housewives. So that is ironic. Uh, standing on the streets of Iberg near the Finnish border. February 1958's article called College Girls Dressed Up, pictured on the left-hand side of your screen, showed the casual clothes that college girls wore during the day and the dresses they wore at night. According to the article, they were fashionable, easy to pack for a weekend getaway, and made doing new dance crazes like the bunny hop easier. Other articles showcased fashion for a day in the city, the summer vacations, maternity wear, and ironically, even clothes to go shopping for more clothing, right? Rather ironic. They always pointed out that these clothes were affordable and practical. But in reality, as we all know, these fashions were unrealistic for the Russian woman who went through harsh winters and clothing shortages. Russian women simply had little access during these times to these types of luxuries. But the magazine did provide alternatives with sewing patterns. For example, December 1959's issue included a smart coat you can make yourself. It provided a versatile pattern for a coat that could become a raincoat, a hostess robe, an evening gown, or a beach dress. These articles showed Russian women that anyone could learn to sew and be fashionable. And by bypassing the Soviet government and appealing directly to women, America's editors prevailed, and so did the U.S. government in its battle for cultural supremacy. If women couldn't purchase Western clothing, they could copy the looks that were in the magazine, spread them throughout the streets of Moscow, and in the process, break down barriers between the East and the West. So while America's editors promoted fashion and femininity, they went to Great Lakes to also convey a wholesomeness that countered stereotypes of American women as being irresponsible glamour girls or overly materialistic. America reflected a domestic pro-natalist ideology. Articles emphasized gendered customs and traditions and introduced women to their ultimate role as supposedly the happy housewife and mother. For example, this image on your left, June 1958's A Young Couple Gets Married stated that a girl's wedding was joyous. It discusses the planning a wedding of an 18-year-old girl named Jenny and her high school sweetheart, Bud, which includes writing a wedding announcement, opening presents, attending her rehearsal, and preparing for her honeymoon. As you can see in this picture, the happy couple is shown leaving their church where family and friends are throwing rice at them. All of these types of articles centered on wholesome customs and traditions and religion consistently played a prominent role. Now, the nuclear family is another topic. Even for those who couldn't have children traditionally, it showed that there were alternatives. March 1957's Adopting a Five-Year-Old told the story of John and Mary Walker, a couple who decided to make their familial dreams come true through adoption. And the article captured the Walker's years of applications and interviews, meeting Billy and taking him home. It described his happiness with his new family, living in suburbia, riding his tricycle, going grocery shopping, eating, playing with his toys, and being read a bedtime story. America essentially attempted to convey that children did make your life complete. So central to this vision of domesticity is a suburban home filled with modern appliances. America portrayed American women as having strong values and work ethics, yet able to take advantage of the modern day conveniences and consumer goods that supposedly made their lives easier. American women worked hard but still had leisure time, and this work-life balance was something USIA officials believed Russian women lacked. And in fact, if we're going to be honest, many Russian women did face a double burden. They participated regularly in the workforce, but under a government that failed to fully socialize child care, even if they enjoyed their work. But instead, in America, modern technology was supposed to improve women's lives. For example, March 1958's Kitchen Appliances, which you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, stated that women wanted time-saving advices, devices and modern appliances to eliminate hard, quote, hard and boring work and make the kitchen larger, cleaner, and brighter. For example, this General Electric family kitchen maximized space, reduced clutter, and improved efficiency. It shows a housewife in her nook where she could very stereotypically talk on the phone, as you can see pictured right here, 
listen to the radio, read cookbooks, and write budgets and shopping lists. Her kitchen was supposed to be a place where she now wanted to be. Once again, the differentiation between American and Russian life was clear. These kitchens could have been commonplace in white middle-class suburban homes, but they would have been luxuries for many Russian women, particularly those urban women who had to share communal kitchens. And they also showed women reaping the rewards of the American way of life. First, because now women had more time saving devices and that they were able to be with their families more often. And secondly, that women consumed first solely for themselves and later in life for their families. They did so easily and frequently and enjoyed it. So America's editors assumed that all women enjoyed shopping and countless articles focused on the process of consumption itself. June 1960s, give the lady what she wants, for example, depicted a rural woman who for her 70th birthday requested that her daughters, quote, turn her loose for a day in Marshall Fields, Chicago's largest department store. It had 400 departments, a large selection of consumer goods under one roof, and allowed for services for a comfortable shopping experience, personal shopping, package delivery, restaurants, a beauty salon, fashion shows, for example. And America also had other articles on major department stores like Sears, as well as the emergence of the shopping mall, which arose as a result of the suburbs. Now, consumption also included the supermarket. America showed its audience that plentiful, healthy, and delicious food concerned all women because they were supposedly the main purchasers of the food. February 1960s issue devoted 10 articles to food production, distribution, and preparation. One showed the modern American supermarket, and it showed a supermarket that was a far cry from Russia's small government-run food stores. It typically consisted of 20,000 square feet, large staff, clean and bright aisles, and fully stocked shelves, as you can see indicated on the image on the right-hand side of your screen. There were products, convenience food items, that were said to liberate American women. Betty Crocker cake mixes, Minute Maid frozen orange juice, Swanson TV dinners, for example. And the article stated that the supermarket was a symbol of an efficient and streamlined distribution system that allowed for affordable food. The article even noted, and I wonder if you can see this in the image right here, there is a notable figure who actually requests to tour a supermarket in 1959 when he visits America, and that is Nikita Khrushchev himself. After he takes a two-week tour of America, he visits a quality food supermarket in San Francisco in 1959. So in depicting department stores, malls, and supermarkets, America attempts to convey to Russian women that mass consumption, an abundance of goods and services in one location makes women's lives convenient. And it also chooses or tries to reflect to them, convey to them that these conveniences cannot be said of their own shopping experiences. Now, I'm going to try and sum this up, which is that these articles are a small sample of what is presented in America throughout its long existence to 1994. But when brought together and analyzed, their importance becomes clear. They present Russian women with an idyllic image of American life. By the end of the decade, the 1950s, the magazine had accomplished broader goals. Journalists and USIA officials boasted about the appeal of America. They noted long lines of people waiting to buy the magazine and visiting Russian homes where they saw worn out copies. Marion Sanders, its first editor, observed that issues were widely circulated amongst colleagues, family, and friends and could have been seen by as many as 20 people. This meant that if 50,000 issues were sold each month, its monthly readership could reach 1 million. U.S. Foreign Service Officer Gail Richmond called America, quote, a minor expense, but a major success in the Cold War of ideas. And perhaps it was so effective, and this should be noted, that Soviet officials actually banned its circulation in U.S. exhibitions that took place throughout the remainder of the Cold War. By 1959, Moscow embassy diplomats reported that with the exception of personal contacts, America made the greatest contribution to the better understanding of America by the Russians and to the provision of accurate information about the US. Journalists and USIA officials noted changes in Russian attitudes. For example, as you can see pictured right here, a December 1959 New York Times article rather condescendingly was titled, New Soviet Plan Feminine Females. 
and it argued that Russian women were still women and wanted to be feminine. The article suggested that all women strove for a beautiful appearance and home, their desire to purchase consumer goods, dress well, and be charming were as enduring as their natural desire to bear children. I emphasize the word condescending here. Russian women began imitating Western styles. According to the article, they went to beauty salons to dye and cut their hair. They had their nails done. Fashion models at Gum, Russia's largest department store, began to wear bright colors, shorter skirts, and Western-styled shoes. Russian citizens and the Soviet press were emboldened in their critiques of Soviet production. USI reports noted that the Soviet newspaper, Zvestia, had called for improvements in clothing. It claimed that workmanship was poor, clothing didn't fit properly, and was dull and dark. The Soviet government did respond with increases in the volume and variety of goods. Interestingly, in March of 1962, USSR ran a special issue on women. It focused, and again, this is America's equivalent, just as a recap, it focused on women's work, but also reflected the impact of Western consumer culture because it, for the first time, included articles on the beauty salon, the department store, and spring fashions, which was a section that it now began to include in each issue. For the USIA, this appeared to be an astounding accomplishment, given that neither the Russian people nor the media had been known to question government priorities. So USI officials and America's editors in providing their subtle critiques of the Soviet government highlighted its strained relationship with female consumers. They wanted Russian women to develop a deep and gradual dissatisfaction with their lives, both because of their limited access to consumer goods and services, as well as their status as working women unable to care for their families full time. So America ended in October of 1994, pictured here on the left-hand side of its screen, of your screen, 38 years after its first issue, with the same girl, supposedly, as an adult now gazing in red again before the sea on its front cover. Communism, as we know, at this point had collapsed, the Cold War had passed, and the mission of the USIA and America had seemingly been accomplished. There appeared to be many who did not want to see the magazine end, including those in the United States Information Agency itself, um, as well as the magazine's editors and writers. And its contents were a glimpse as a result of years of publication into a way of life that the Russian people now gradually began to embrace, at least in terms of its consumer-oriented ideology. A 34-year-old housewife, Katya Chisova, looked forward to reading the magazine, and this is just one anecdote. According to her, it was a, quote, interesting way to read about scientific achievements and in general about the American way of life. She wrote, I can tell you that for many, it meant a lot. People had very little information about life abroad and their interest in America was great. So with this conclusion, I hope that this presentation has reflected the importance of studying women normative gender roles and the American way of life, namely consumer-oriented capitalism in relation to foreign policy and diplomacy, not just within the Cold War, but also more broadly. I also hope that it has reflected the necessity for further discussion on the decline of the Soviet Union and the impact of soft power, which I think often goes under-recognized, and that includes cultural diplomacy. So for example, what really ended the Cold War? We tend to attribute it to the Soviet Union's military and economic decline, as well as the powers of great, great leaders such as Gorbachev and Reagan, uh, which undoubtedly is true. But I think that the answer should be more complex. The successes or failures of military initiatives can be gauged almost immediately, but cultural diplomacy can take years to reveal its effectiveness. This was the case for the USIA's information program in Russia. By the end of the decade, the 1950s, which I discussed, due in part to America, a newfound cultural outlook had emerged. During the summer of 1959, the USIA, as I'm sure many of you are aware, given the context of the kitchen debates between Nixon and Khrushchev, the USIA held a six week long exhibition in Moscow, most remembered for those kitchen debates. 
During this time, Russian women were finally able to see and interact with American women and observe and touch the consumer goods that they had seen in America. They began to demand these products themselves as a result of America and as a result of the exhibition. In September of 1959, as I had indicated previously, Khrushchev became the first Soviet leader to tour the U.S. for two weeks and with 54 people, including friends, family, and, of course, uh, political associations. When he returned home, he acknowledged the demand for consumer goods and declared he would increase production. Now, in reality, we all know that his government failed to provide its citizens with the level of consumer goods seen in the United States, but these first glimpses of American-style capitalism, as shown in America, really set the stage for increased demands for consumer goods. This 1951 cartoon pictured here on the right-hand side of your screen, which I love, um, it depicts booklets on, quote, U.S. living standards blasted behind the Iron Curtain while a Russian woman instructed her husband, Ivan, to look at the, quote, electric washing machines, sewing machines, and refrigerators depicted in its pages. It aptly reflects the sentiments of the USIA, which in 1959 boldly declared in reference to Russia that it is not likely that this buying public will ever be the same again. So I do want to thank you for taking the time to listen to um, and, and to hopefully engage in a conversation afterwards about this topic and my book in general. And again, I do want to thank um, the organizers and Katharina for her comments uh, that are to follow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think now where is my turn. Uh, and I'm really happy uh, to talk a few words about this book. Maybe you can see I have a hard copy. Uh, and uh, it's really also beautiful edited uh, because the book is mostly about images. So the cover, the images are really very important for me. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to tell about the book. Uh, as I'm a cultural historian interested most in gender and women's history, this is really a, a very good opportunity for me to talk about the book, which is about women, which is about gender, and which in fact uh, is about cultural history. Uh, I think that first of all, winning women's hearts and minds is a great contribution to the cultural history of the Cold War. But at the same time, it offers a broader meaning of the political history. Uh, a broader meaning because uh, it goes beyond the history of political struggle, uh, of simply political diplomacy, the so-called traditional diplomacy. Uh, and instead, uh, it addresses the history of cultural diplomacy and the history of soft power. And what is particularly valuable in this book uh, is Diana Stuchu's use of gender as a category of historical analysis. Uh, she does not write a gender history of Cold War, but she introduces the gender perspective to the history of political thought, showing how gender worked in political propaganda and how gender was essential for the construction of citizenship. Before coming to details, uh, I'd like to list the most important points that make the book so interesting for me and so valuable. First of all, there are this gendered understanding of citizenship both in the USA and in the Soviet Union and other countries of the bloc. Then the politicization of the private sphere, I mean of the household, of the home and family. Then the focus on two competing visions of modernity, because I strongly believe that this book is also about two visions of modernity, about uh, modernity and modernization, which was linked to the development of capitalist economy, and on the other hand, 
about the so-called socialist modernity or communist modernity. The next thing I'd like to emphasize is the author's focus on the popular culture texts. Uh, I really appreciate that this book is based on the analysis of the latest home journal uh, as uh, a point of reference for the America. Uh, I also would like to point to the analysis of the visual texts of propaganda. Uh, it's not easy uh, to analyze visual historical texts. Maybe sometimes it seems attractive, it seems easy, but if we want uh, to offer a really in-depth analysis and not to use this visual text only as an illustration, it really is a, a difficult thing, and I think that Diana is successful in this in her approach uh, to the visual sources. Uh, and the last thing, uh, which is for me really important and really striking, uh, is the analysis of the women's images in soft propaganda. Uh, I think this images were also essential for soft propaganda uh, and they are more important than only a simple illustration. Uh, the book uh, examines how the products of the modern popular culture, such as lifestyle magazines, were used as a tool of public diplomacy or soft power. Diana Chuchos analyzes the magazine America edited by the US Information Agency, which offered, in fact, a model of the Western women's or lifestyle journalism in order to play a propagandistic role in the court war competition. She shows how the images, the images of perfect womanhood, of perfect domestic life, and actually the image of modernity were employed as an instrument of soft political propaganda. Uh, as Diana showed in her book, America's creators mimicked the content of the best-selling American women's magazines, Ladies Home Journal, to communicate or to sell American values, freedom, family, femininity, and abundance to Soviet audience, whom uh, the domestic propaganda showed a completely different image of American way of life. It was the image of Western consumerism, of the idle life of American housewives, deprived of political rights, political agency, and enslaved in their bourgeois households. And Diana Chuchos discusses here the notions of true femininity of female attractiveness as it was presented in American mainstream culture and she reconstructed its message. Uh, its message was that while American women enjoyed the special privilege of a life centered on home and family, Soviet women suffered under special hardships of their, of their uh, double burden being denied also the opportunity to cultivate their natural femininity. Uh, I guess that this opposition between uh, being a full-time housewife and the double burden of Soviet women was central for the vision of gendered citizenship and for the vision of gendered modernity. And here, I strongly believe that uh, uh, this is the value of the book that Diana Chuchus shows very important thing, the importance of women as citizens. Uh, she shows how gendered women's citizenship was constructed in the United States uh, and in the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. Of course, there are so many studies showing how women were used for different political purposes. 
Uh, and winning women's minds and hearts is also about it, but not only. It goes further. And in her analysis, Diana shows how women were in fact uh, a part of a larger political and cultural process in which the US government defined their roles in traditional terms of femininity and also tied them to the emerging mass consumption society uh, and presented them abroad in order to attract Russian women to win their women, uh, minds and hearts. So she shows how American women, in fact, white middle-class women, became constructed as important symbols in the ideological battle of the Cold War uh, as so-called happier and more prosperous lifestyle was used to show the merits of capitalism. But what is crucial, Diana emphasized that this construction of perfect American femininity defined women's citizenship. Uh, in her analysis of Ladies Home Journal, she pointed to its political message and somehow she challenged the common opinion that popular women's magazines, especially popular women's magazines in America and in, uh, in the so-called West, reinforced women's political passivity. On the contrary, she presented that the magazine encouraged their readers to participate in public life and defined them as citizens. Like other magazines, Ladies Home Journal used anti-communist sentiment to advocate for women's political participation and to promote a positive image of politically active women devoted to their nation and devoted to American values. Ladies Home Journal articles, as well as letters to the editors, as showed Diana Chuchus, indicate that average American women did listen to these calls to action and were, in fact, politically active during the Cold War in many ways, on the small local scale, but also on the larger scale. So this is really crucial for me that this book shows how women were constructed as citizens. And for me, this is a very important question and maybe very important field of research just to compare how Soviet, uh, how women's citizenship was constructed in Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc and how it was constructed uh, in the West and especially in the United States. Um, at the first place, we can see that uh, American women's citizenship was based on consumption, while in uh, the uh, in Russia and Soviet Russia, it was based on production. But I think it's a kind of oversimplification and consumption was also very important uh, in the official discourse in Soviet Union. This is the second thing, uh, except these gendered notions of citizenship, uh, which is very important for me in this book. This is the focus on consumption and the political meaning of consumption. Uh, it was also clearly visible, for example, in Poland, uh, where after the post-Stalinist show, the consumption, the so-called moderate consumption, uh, entered the public discourse and the official party state propaganda. So I think consumption is here really very important. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, uh, can we say that the notions of gender worked also as an element of the competing concepts of modernity, Western modernity and socialist modernity? Uh, I strongly appreciate that 
in the analysis of the ladies' home journal and uh, in the analysis of the official discourse on women's roles in the United States, Diana Chuchus showed uh, that women were not only recipients, not only the audience and the public to this message, but they also participated in the process of discourse production. Uh, in the book, especially, uh, uh, Diana focuses uh, on the role that Dorothy Thompson played in the Ladies' Home Journal. And that's why I'd like to ask her about the role of popular experts in American women's magazines. Because I think it's crucial, it's crucial to show that women also were the discourse producers. Uh, the next thing uh, I uh, find uh, really exciting uh, is the analysis of the visual text of propaganda and of the visual, uh, uh, visual materials. Uh, I use the term visual texts not illustrations, but visual texts, because I strongly believe that as written texts, they had their own message and it was more complicated than only an illustration. Uh, and that's why I appreciated uh, that uh, Diana focuses on the visual texts of America and not on the analysis, for example, of uh, broadcasting of uh, the voice of America. Uh, and uh, talking about visual texts and visual attractiveness of America, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some uh, pictures, some images, and this is the images uh, from the Polish version of America. And on the other hand, uh, also the images from the magazine Krajrad, it means Soviet Union. It was edited in Poland. I remember this magazine. It was edited on a very good paper uh, and it was a high quality magazine. But uh, the aesthetic norms, uh, the aesthetic conventions used in those both magazines were completely different. And I think Diana also shows how uh, America as a tool of soft propaganda developed its own aesthetic norms and aesthetic categories. So uh, let me, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I can't. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, it will be only a very, very short presentation uh, because uh, uh, as you can see here, oh, this is, Soviet Union, Kerajad, the magazine which was edited from 1958 till 1990, uh, till the collapse of communism. As, as you can see, here are cosmonauts, but also beautiful women. Beautiful woman, yes. But uh, on this first uh, cover, we can see a beautiful woman in blue jeans. Yes, Soviet woman in blue jeans. Uh, but uh, I think she is at work. Or after all, she is not in this very cozy uh, domestic, uh, 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 in this cozy home. Yes, if it's not sweet home, but, but it's rather, uh, I think, associated with her work. And here we can see America, the Polish version of America, uh, which like, uh, I think, uh, very similar to Russian version, uh, it focuses on people, on people in leisure activities. They are colorful uh, and they are focused on individuals. Here, uh, it's from the inside. Uh, so uh, we can see these pictures of consumption, yes? Here with, uh, we can see something like a pins or something like this. This is popular culture, uh, this is consumption, and this is really very, very attractive. And what's most important, it uses different categories and different aesthetic canons uh, than uh, this uh, Soviet magazine. 
Uh, and I think it was really very visible in Diana's uh, book. And uh, finishing, I'd like to ask Diana a few questions. Uh, firstly, I'd like to ask her about this popular experts who transmitted expert knowledge to a wider audience in the Ladies' Home Journal. Uh, and more general question about the female citizenship. Uh, do you agree that uh, America and this uh, soft propaganda not only used women, but also somehow constructed the notions of women's citizenship? And uh, the last question, I'm... I'm not sure if you, maybe you, uh, uh, we didn't talk about it, but I'm thinking also about the notions of otherness and whiteness. Uh, you showed uh, how uh, in uh, American propaganda, firstly, Soviet women were constructed as other, as not feminine, uh, as other. Um, but in domestic propaganda uh, in Soviet Union, uh, for example, this is also interesting because Soviet women were mostly shown as white. Women from Asian republics, I think, were rather marginalized in public discourse. And they appeared in official Soviet media and also in media in Poland, uh, for example, only when they were needed to prove the regime's cultural openness. So I'm thinking whether this absence of women of color in the magazine was not a deliberate attempt to appeal to a Soviet audience. Uh, because I strongly believe that uh, this propaganda offered uh, discursive constructions. Uh, thank you. And uh, I really recommend reading this book, because this is a very original proposition, which goes far beyond uh, what we know about the cultural diplomacy of the Cold War. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. Diana, would you like to answer the questions then? And then we can start the discussion with the audience, I, I, I would suggest. Uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, yes, I would like, yep. Uh, so I can respond to your questions and... Respond to the, to the questions first and then we can see how many other questions. I, I have few as well because it's really interesting for me as well as someone who, who, who rose up in, in Poland, so. Okay, I'm so glad. Thank you so much. Uh, and Katarzyna, thank you for these comments and your thorough review and um just interesting comments and questions in general i really really appreciate them uh so a couple of things well in relation to your questions and things that stood out to me so you mentioned uh well first of all you you originally had three points which i wouldn't mind touching on briefly just in terms of the gendered um understanding of citizenship and things like that and the differentiation between the us and the ussr which is quite interesting uh, the politicization of the household, which is, I think, something that we don't discuss enough, but it has always been politicized, right? So I love that you commented on that and noted that. And competing visions of modernity, what constitutes modernity? And is modernity, I think, sometimes relation in relation to consumption or is it in relation to women's progress and equal status, you know, as we had possibly in the Soviet Union, right? I say this also coming from the perspective of, well, I'm not Russian. My parents grew up in the former Yugoslavia. And so under a communist country, although the third way sort of. And so there is some understanding of, you know, a, um, a Western style of life, but also a communist style of life as well, which is quite interesting uh, to be in the middle of that. But I'm actually just going to answer your direct questions right now. Um, and then maybe we can get back to some of the other comments that you made, which I found very interesting. So in terms of popular um, experts uh, who exported knowledge and, you know, for example, um, for example, in the Ladies Home Journal, you would have, I would say, quote, popular authors. 
uh, that were exhibited in the magazine. You had Dorothy Thompson, which I discussed extensively, who had a regular column, essentially that always discussed the Cold War. And Dorothy Thompson was one of the most notable female journalists of the 20th century, so much that she got herself banned from Nazi Germany um, and had written books about Nazi Germany, as well as of Soviet Russia, condemning both of those regimes. Um, John Steinbeck is one I highlight more extensively in my book as well, um, and Robert Coppa and uh, their work on, um, on the Soviet Union. Um, other ones that I I look at again. I, I had I have about twenty or thirty minutes during this conversation, um, so I can't highlight everything. But uh, for example, Lydia Kirk, who was uh, the ambassador's wife to the Soviet Union um, in the early Cold War period, writes this extensive um, sort of article or series of letters actually. And she later writes a book called Letters from Moscow where she absolutely admonishes the Soviet regime. But also very interestingly has this insider perspective because she as an ambassador's wife, she's very critical. She's obviously very much used to an elitist sort of privileged lifestyle in the US and then goes to Russia and everything sort of falls apart. But she very strategically writes these letters. Um, to her children and then publishes them, which shows you a lot of to her intentions. Um, the editors of the Ladies Home Journal themselves are Beatrice and um, Bruce Gold. They're a married couple who were the editors from 1935 until the mid 1960s. And they are, it's quite interesting. They're quite feminist for the time period in their approach to Ladies Home Journal articles and their output. They're also critical of the Soviet regime. Those are the most notable figures I can think of um, that had articles during this time. Of course, later on, we see Betty Friedan, who has articles for the Ladies Home Journal, but those ones are most consistent and very notable in terms of um, popular authors and experts, so-called experts and things like that. In terms of what is published in America Magazine, I would say that the authors in those articles are generally individuals who are, you know, I would say ordinary journalists and authors who don't have big published pieces or anything like that um, that make them extremely notable. Uh, the most notable person would be Marion Sanders. Uh, again, another like Dorothy Thompson, one of the most iconic figures in 20th century journalism. Um, but she is the editor of the magazine in those initial years before it's discontinued in 1952. So I wouldn't say there's anybody super notable. Uh, one that would strike out is, at me is Jane Jacobs, um, the author, writer, American turned Canadian, um, ironically, given that I'm Canadian, um, who wrote on urban pathways and history and things like that, urban and regional planning. She had quite a few articles in America Magazine. So I would say she is a big one, but I wouldn't say that there was, was anybody very notable that would regularly appear in America. So it's possibly, I think, as you alluded to, individuals who are trying to convey popular concepts and ideas, not necessarily experts um, in the field. Whereas, of course, in the Ladies Home Journal, much more notable in the United States, you would have these experts that are trying to deliver content and things like that. Um, in relation to your second question, I believe, which is citizenship, right? Um, how it was constructed as I, you know, as you've alluded to, and as I did as well. Uh, well, what is citizenship, right? And how do you define citizenship, right? In the context of the United States citizenship, very much in the context of, for example, Elizabeth Cohen's book called A Consumer's Republic. Citizenship in the context of the mid 20th century is in relation to how much you consume, at least in relation to women, because the citizen consumer is so important, right? Um, and of course, we know that this is a stark contrast to the type of citizenship that exists in the Soviet Union, which is a woman is working. Uh, she is supposedly equal in every element of life. She is working, is able to obtain an education, but 
At the same time, according to the U.S. perspective, she is not allowed to have the same types of access to consumer goods as an American woman have has. Um, of course, as we know, in the context of the Soviet Union, uh, American women, well, they may have access to consumer goods, but they don't have access to the same level of education or it, for the most part work um, equal pay um, that um, Soviet women do or Russian women do. And I, I apologize, please let me know if I'm not answering this question properly. I can elaborate a little bit further. Um, and, and then finally, actually this question was quite interesting because of course I didn't have enough time to get into it but I, it alludes to otherness. Um, and I depict, at least in this presentation, the other as being the Russian babushka. And to that extent, yes, uh, she is the other. But I do also think that there are many others um, in the context of mid 20th century American womanhood. And of course the other big other is uh, the image of the racialized minority. And typically, um, in a time where certain women are neglected, well, in particular, this is the African-American woman, right? So the other, I think when you think of it in the context of the Ladies' Home Journal um, or other women's magazines at the time, you might think of the African-American woman who has little access um, to, you know, white middle-class suburban um, conveniences in a home in the suburbs, two cars, for example. Uh, but the other, of course, is also that Russian babushka in the broader context of the Cold War and foreign policy. So so just a few things I want to note in terms of, quote, the other in, in relation to race, um, for example. I do discuss this in the book a bit further, which is that, for example, throughout the 1950s, when America is reinstated or reemerges, there are very few articles on African-American women um, and girls in general. Um, there are several articles, for example, one which focuses on the coming out or sort of, you know, this tradition of the Southern debutante ball, um, if you know about this, um, in the context of the Southern United States where um, a young girl is basically brought out before a group of people uh, with a pastor before her family and friends and it shows that she is essentially coming of age and ready to perhaps date and get married. Um, those articles are very few. The first magazine or the first issue that actually showcases an African-American female is Marian Anderson, an African-American opera singer. And it shows her on the front cover, but then just has a very short article, ironically, on her in the be in the middle of the magazine, and that's it. So in the book, I also discuss the fact that America's editors actually don't really focus on African Americans, the African American experience or the civil rights movement until about the late 1960s, which is very interesting. They choose to ignore this, and it's similar to what you said, Katharina, which is that um, where USSR's or Soviet life's um, issues or the version in Poland does not necessarily focus on the other as extensively. America's editors don't do this as well. And in part, my belief is that, my understanding is that they don't do this because they don't want to focus on the negatives that are taking place in American society. They don't want to give essentially the Soviet Union more fodder to provide negative propaganda to criticize them or anything like that. So they essentially present this very positive image of what is happening in the United States, in spite of the fact that by, of course, the late 1950s, well, even prior to that, you have, you know, a civil rights movement that is taking place, led by Martin Luther King. You have boycotts um, on, on buses, on uh, the March on Washington, all of these things. None of this is depicted in the magazine until the late 1960s when they actually have a special issue on the civil rights movement. Otherwise, it is essentially ignored up until this time period, save for an article or two that focuses on this. In the same vein, they do the same thing with the women's rights movement. So again, I discuss this in the book, which is that just in a nutshell, during the 1960s, the USIA and America doesn't really discuss women at all. They do generally always have an article in each issue that focuses on beauty and fashion. So they do keep this in mind. And 
they eliminate all of the other articles that focus on, you know, for example, women's traditional roles and things like that. It's sort of aligned with the rise of the feminist movement, but they don't actually address the feminist movement until 1971 when they have a special issue that addresses this newly emerging women's movement. They don't state that it's feminist, um, but they do discuss the newly changing arenas of women's lives and um, how outspoken they've become essentially. Um, so they take quite a bit of time. Ironically, again, the USSR magazine does have an issue related to women in 1962, almost a decade earlier, where they do focus on women's issues and choices, I guess, but more so in relation to work um, rather than anything else. So essentially America is quite slow um, to recap with acknowledging changes in American society. And they also don't want to acknowledge that there are any negative sides to American life in general. But I do think um, this could be a whole other book, to be honest, I wish I would have had time to work on it. Maybe it's a future um, project, <laughs> but the USSR, the magazine, the equivalent in the United States I would love to compare to see uh, when they came out with, you know, certain topics and issues and just do a comparison. So that would be really fascinating. And I appreciate you sharing the images of um, actually the Polish versions. Actually, I do have to say one interesting uh, little comment was when you showed the images of, uh, well, for example, the cover with the Polish woman in her denim overalls. Um, this is really funny. There is an article that appears again, I had mentioned that in America, they continuously, even if they eliminate gender roles in the 1960s, they always had an article on beauty and fashion. And there is an article on jeans and how they are becoming increasingly popular in the Soviet Union and how they, it literally says that they are the great democratizer because anyone can wear them if you're rich, if you're or if you're a farmer, if you're a Hollywood producer or anything like that. And it basically states that jeans are accessible to everyone. So I find it amazing that that is one of the images that you included because jeans were seen as being very popular across the board around the world. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And if I can uh, say a few words about these jeans, it's really interesting because uh, it somehow was a luxury in Poland uh, to have original jeans. Because, you know, uh, there were some attempts to produce uh, our own Polish jeans and also in the GDR. Uh, also in the GDR, uh, there was a special factory which produces uh, socialist German jeans, but they used the cotton from Uzbekistan. And it was a different kind of cotton than American cotton. And that's why uh, this socialist jeans uh, was, uh, was different, was completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you. I uh, I really I forgot about uh, one thing which is very important in your book. This is that you show the dynamics, the dynamics of this uh, soft propaganda, uh, and you show how it was changing over the time. Uh, it's really very very important. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, I think we are uh, opening the discussion to our audience. Um, as we are not a uh, big audience, I, I would suggest if anyone wants to switch on the camera, it would be nice. We can see each other and talk. To, if, if it's okay for you, Diana and, and Katarzyna, I think it would be, would be nicer than asking questions in a chat. Sure, that would be great. So if... If someone wants to, it would be really nice if we can see each other. And um, as I said, I have also a few questions. Do, do we have any questions for the audience? Maybe I will, won't be so selfish and <laughs> just put my question in there. I can't read any in a chat. I think I, I would get them. 
So maybe maybe I, I just can ask my questions first. Um, you are talking about the consumerism and the consume and showing the beautiful things you can buy in America, uh, trying to change uh, or not to change to um, get influence on women's minds in USSR and Eastern Europe and communist countries or socialist countries. But um, what I was thinking about as I, I, I was a child, we also have some magazines, not only America, America, I don't really know, but other magazines showing, uh, for example, things you can buy in Germany. I come from Silesia, so we had a more exchange with Germany. And it was not just about having the things. I think it was also about the aesthetics. That was really important for, for me as a child. And I think also for women, not just having wanting to have uh, the same style of of life mm -hmm. that was just about having things that you can consider beautiful it was like for children having toys they were they were just much more beautiful than the toys that we could afford or we could buy in in in, in socialist countries uh, do you think it was um not only about the consume, it was also about aesthetics and selling the kind of aesthetics, in, or it was just about putting, um, like, a, like the cha uh, the channeling the kind of politics for women or selling the American way of life, but just as a politician, political and uh, political view or consume view. So there is this saying, it's called keeping up with the Joneses, right? And so I, I'm not sure how widely this would possibly be used in um, Central or Eastern Europe, probably not. But it's this idea where if your neighbor has something or your friend or family member has something you wanted to simply for the sake of having it, right? And so I'm not sure if maybe that's what you're referring to, but this was certainly the case in many cases when I grew up as well, uh, which was that you don't necessarily need something, but you want to have it because other people have it. And so I, I wonder if that's what you're referring to. I, what I'm thinking, it's not that it was not about the consumerism at, as you, you want to have it. It was like, in my point of view, of, of my view, it was like a need for, a, for beautiful things that you mm -hmm. couldn't have in, in, in socialist countries. For me, I was a child in this time, so it was like having toys that I just nice and colorful and look nice, not just a gray teddy bear <laughs> that was not so interesting. So Honestly, maybe it's one really useful, right? It just you just wanted to have it for the sake of having it, uh, right? I mean. Yes, yes, but it, I think it was also about about having beautiful things. It was not I, 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 what I was in, in my in my remembrance. Um, socialism was really a great thing. Like you know, that's what how it was shown on on the on the pictures, and there was a difference to the Western countries. And I think it uh, even if it was selling the consumerism, I think it was a big motion to have the same consume things in socialism uh, in the end of the 80s as the system changed. So I, I I don't think it was just like, you know, um, channeling the thing from America. It was really the need for the consume, uh, for, the, for the things you couldn't afford or you couldn't buy in, in socialist countries. I don't know how Katarzyna sees this, but I think it was just to live like in West Europe or in USA and in Poland was USA much more much important more important than Western Europe for many people. It was like the, the the way of life, but it was not like you know that someone had to sell it to you. I think it was just experience that is something like this. You wanted to have it. You wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I agree that it was a kind of imagined West, yes, and also of imaginary America. Uh, and I totally agree, especially uh, according to the 80s, yes, to the 1980s and the Polish crisis, uh, where the, uh, with these extreme shortages 
of nearly everything yeah. that people dreamt uh, dreamt about aesthetics, about beautiful things, beautiful clothes, and so on and so on. But uh, earlier, a bit earlier, for example, from 1968, uh, in 1968, uh, it was established a magazine, a Reclama. Uh, uh, so uh, it was about advertising. It was a magazine devoted to advertising in Polish, in socialist Poland, and it was mostly about aesthetic. Uh, there are so many articles about aesthetics and so many pictures, pictures of beautiful things, uh, of uh, beautiful household appliances, for example, of beautiful clothes and cars and so on and so on. And this is most, this was mostly the message about aesthetics and this aesthetics somehow mirrored this imagined Western aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I think that aesthetics was really, really important because I also remember from my childhood that I wanted to have uh, Western toys because they were beautiful. I wanted to have, for example, uh, I don't know, a notebook. Oh, yes, it was a perfect gift, a notebook from Western countries, from France or from Germany, because they were beautiful. Such they were beautiful and they were not expensive. It was not important to have one uh, notebook, yes, but it was beautiful. So it was somehow about the beauty. Uh, but I think it also, uh, it's a great, a great subject for a specific research uh, because uh, we must uh, remember about the dynamics, that it was completely different in the 80s and different in the 60s and in the 50s. And in Poland, we had this Institute uh, of Industrial Design, for example, Institute of Zainstwa Przemysłowego, which really cared about aesthetics. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. aesthetics was important. These are really good points. I, I mean, I, I guess I focus on images because I I do think the imagery and the pictures are important, but to show or for you, both of you to say that the aesthetics are important and that you're looking at these images and that you think you, or that you wanted something beautiful, uh, something pretty, something nice, um, not that you didn't have it before. It it just goes to show you that imager, images, pictures are very important in all of this. And, and just going back to even the magazine, just thinking about, well, the magazine in many cases, just like Life magazine, had extensive amounts of images, but less words as well. So it's almost as if you didn't need to even read what was taking place in the article. You just saw the images and then you might see that you want that, or this is how you could be, or this is the life that you could experience, uh, for example. So, so it's quite interesting though. And then I, I wonder as barriers are breaking down during the 1980s, if you can recall, or maybe you can recall with your parents, is this more of a, um, more of a scenario where you think more and more so that you want this, particularly as Gorbachev comes into power and everything sort of breaks down a little bit more. There's more opportunity possibly, or in Poland, it's like they started in the middle of the 80s that you can afford things also produced in Poland, but they were designed as the things you produced in, in Western Europe. So mm -hmm. there's more and more private companies producing things. Of course, we have beautiful things you could buy in, in some kind of stores in Poland and uh, also high quality. But it was not about the quality. That's what it said about the images, that what we looked into as children were not like magazines. It was like selling catalogs. Just You just had the pictures. You, don't, you didn't have any text about it. So it was like looking at it like hours and uh, thinking, oh, I would like to have this or this or this or this. <laughs> And for, for my grandmother, she, she could see very, very well. So it was like looking for uh, dresses she could make for us. Mm -hmm. It was more like uh, looking for, for really, that's why I, I, find, I thought it was not just selling the way of life. It was kind of selling the aesthetics. When you compare those two p p pictures from the 50s about the uh, girls uh, dressing up, 
uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, photo from the street in 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 somewhere in in in, in the USSR. And the second question, I, I think you partly uh, um, answered it. Um, did the Russian version also has kind of impact because you said that there was an impact you could you could uh, see on uh, um, Russian women, especially after the uh, uh, Khrushchev's uh, uh, journey, and there was the uh, uh, question: Did there was the impact from the Russian version the USSR sold in America on the American women? There was this mention like for uh, feminists, there's a kind of, of they have more rights than the, as we are, as we have. And do you, did, so, did, 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 did they notice any impact of this Russian magazine on American society? So again, I'm looking at American archives, right? And to be quite honest, um, there is very little information on USSR, that magazine distributed in America. To me, that somewhat shows that the magazine had little impact, but also it shows that American propaganda will not ever recognize that a USSR magazine distributed in America would have any impact. I think it would have impact in small circles, for example, Communist Party individuals in the United States or anything, anybody who is socialist or left leaning in the United States, probably in universities and things like that. Um, I was able to and have access through some of these issues through my local through the University of Toronto. Um, again, I would like to look into it more in depth. Um, but you can also see the difference between the magazine and let's be honest, I mean, these magazines in the, okay, when it becomes distributed, it's 1956. Americans are now used to, again, these glossy, you know, magazines filled with images and things like that, going into the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Life magazine, women's, ma or women's magazines like the Ladies Home Journal. USSR is not like this. I would say that they probably do have more color images than what you would see in a magazine in of the Soviet Union or Russia, but it's very bland, a <laughs> basic magazine. So if we're going to talk about just to our previous discussion about images and aesthetics and things like that, this is not a magazine that I think many Americans who are very, you know, very, um, you know, I, I would say just interested in the moment, especially when you have visuals coming out, magazines, television, things like that. I don't think that they would be particularly drawn towards it. So even if it had interesting content and some of it is quite interesting, I can see it being fallen by the wayside because it just, it it looks like an aesthetically unpleasing type of magazine. So that said, um, America Magazine has not been written about extensively. And this is an American magazine in the Soviet Union or in Russia. So you can imagine that USSR has been very minimally written about. There is no book on this. I have yet to encounter a full length article on it or anything like that. So it's very minimal. Even when going to the archives, um, well in Washington, which is where all of these issues would exist, there is very little information. So it's something that I would need to do more research on. Um, just to figure it out. But it also shows me that um, even if there was an impact, archivists have just simply neglected this uh, magazine and its impact because there's very little that I have found out there after having done extensive research. Now, if somebody has all of the issues on hand, it would be lovely to analyze them, but I haven't come across that really extensively, at least close to where I live in being in Canada. Um, but of course the magazines are fundamentally different, um, in their approach, the glossy, um, colored images versus black and white images of essentially what I'd indicated, which is daily life in the Soviet union, which revolves around work, labor, um, you know, healthcare, these sorts of things, which are solid topics. 
but not the trendy topics that Americans want to focus on, like consumerism um, or, or, or with the fun images as well. Sorry, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. It was, it was, like do we have now any questions from the audience except my questions? I have more of them. Oh, hello, Anna. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, hello. Um, I have a question, a little bit different question. Uh, so I heard that uh, central uh, to your research was uh, visual material. So I have a question of met methodological nature. So how how you um, approach this visual material from this me methodological point of view? What was your methodology? And also, what was the dynamic between the visuals and the text in this uh, in this uh, magazine that you analyzed. So this, this is my question. Uh, well, I mean, looking at the images, um, I mean, th this is where I really started from because even just growing up, I noticed I always had an affin affinity towards um, looking at print culture and the images. And just as actually, ironically, Alina and Katarzyna stated, you look at the aesthetics and you think even as a little girl, uh, for example, if you can't read everything, if you don't know, um, all of the words or anything like that, or even if you're a non-English speaker, looking at one of these magazines or anything like that, the images are what draws you the most, right? So I, I sort of looked at that. So I, again, my research was at the National Archives. And um, and essentially, I, I mean, I just went into it uh, sort of thinking, well, I looked at the magazine and and again, the magazine was very much like a life magazine at the time period where you had colorful images of anything and everything, but again, mainly related to uh, consumer-oriented capitalism with very minimal words, something, again, that you would find in Life magazine. And so I thought, well, th this is quite interesting. What is the purpose behind all of this? Um, well, again, the purpose is this is a propagandist, I, again, as I indicated previously, polite propaganda, where its purpose is to show Russian readers wherever you live, America Magazine was generally disseminated in urban centers. And this was in part for fear of, well, the Soviet government could actually um, monitor who actually picked up copies of this magazine, especially if they were in urban centers. Now, the fear was that if you went to the periphery, if you went to the outer edges of the Soviet Union and these magazines spread, a neighbor handed it to a neighbor, a family member handed it to a friend or something like that, you might actually encounter somebody that is not really um, a, very much a proponent of, you know, the communist regime or something, somebody who's wavering. And they may become more discontent, especially if they see how life is outside of the Soviet Union, right? So, I, so the idea here is that looking at images without these words, the words were not extensive, the descriptions are very brief, they're very simplistic. And then you could also, again, sway people towards that way of life through the visuals, through the aesthetics that we just um, discussed. So this was my thinking when I, uh, you know, my original actual um, source of subject matter was the American National Exhibition, which took place in Moscow in 1959, the Khrushchev debates or the uh, kitchen debate, sorry. And then I was drawn towards this and, and I just thought with these visuals, how could people not be lured towards this? Especially again, I alluded to the fact that Voice of America did exist, but there are no images. So you just have people talking and it's also frequently jammed, right? By the Soviet government. So, so again, my thinking was that, you know, this was, you know, a, a good place to approach this idea that, well, soft power is extremely important and you can do this through cultural diplomacy and you can do this through images, particularly during this time period where, I mean, television doesn't exist anywhere. Radio is sort of limited and blocked and we don't have the social media uh, that exists today. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if, there's anything else. I've... Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Yes, please. Maybe if I could, thank you so much for this presentation. That was absolutely fascinating to me and I am looking forward to reading the book. Uh, and I'm so sorry because I, I joined late. So maybe my question, you answered it at the beginning, but I, I didn't hear the answer because we talked a lot about uh, streamlining gender stereotypes through this magazine. And I was thinking, what about 
winning men's hearts and minds. <laughs> um, what so was there? Um, I don't know specific pages that maybe were dedicated. I don't know to cars or some other typically male uh, consumer culture. Is it something that is present in the magazine through the years? Does it evolve? I know that maybe it wasn't the focus of, of your research, but I'm sure you have some insights. I love this question. Uh, this is a very good question. Is this, sorry, is it Ina or Ina or? Ina. 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 Yes. Awesome question. Thank you so much. Um, so of course, uh, you know, if you're, if you're involved in women's or gender studies, you always think about the other, right? And I guess my other was Soviet woman or Russian woman or uh, African-American woman to an extent. Um, and so I did wonder the extent to which I should focus on men and male studies and their focus in the magazine. So, so I would say if there were regular um, articles, regular articles, I hate to say that, um, they could they could be seen as appealing to both men and women. Um, I would say a disproportionate amount of the magazine's contest focused on women. So there were articles that men might find appealing, um, but, but this is to say that not to stereotype, but women might find these articles appealing. Given the context of who you're appealing to or who, who your audience is in Russia or the Soviet Union, um, articles, you know, there were, there were articles on urban centers, um, transportation, vehicles, um, vacations, science, healthcare, any of those articles, of course, could appeal to men, 100%, just as they could appeal to women. There were several articles, but I would say more so going into the 1960s that actually had men's fashion, which were interesting. Um, because this didn't really happen earlier on. Um, but it is to say that if there were articles that were geared towards anyone in particular, it would be the woman or it would be the family. And so then, of course, the woman is involved as well. So if you had articles on vacations, which they definitely did, it would be the whole family involved, men and women and children. Uh, you might have articles, for example, the one that I indicated about adoption and the family. Well, it included the male and the female um, adopting their child. And possibly you didn't see this if you came in late, but it talked about a couple adopting their child, but it did mainly focus on the female and her process of adopting the child. The male was somewhat secondary because the woman was staying at home with her child, um, these sorts of things. So I found disproportionately where you would have, you would have general articles, okay? that discuss both the male and female experiences. You might have actually work experiences, but what was also interesting was that you might have women who are working, but they would also be juxtaposed with their husband who's working in a similar position. So if you have a female doctor, then you would have the male doctor who's her husband. Uh, well, you have a female realtor, but then you have her husband who, you know, is working to upkeep the household, which is actually very uh, progressive for the time because her husband was taking care of the kids while she was actually working as a realtor. Some of these examples, but for the most part, I didn't find very many articles that were geared specifically towards men. It was typically for women, for families, and then the husband would be secondary. Again, aside from those articles where you might have, um, you know, um, talk again, there are quite a few articles on infrastructure, um, transportation, cars, um, things like that, which could be interpreted as, you know, uh, being geared towards anyone. But the funny thing is too, even articles such as cars, um, would show women behind the cars because, um, you know, they needed to transport their children to school and things like that. Um, so th this is actually quite funny. The American National Exhibition in 1959 actually had this great pamphlet. And I say great because it's just so funny. It's Ford automobiles and it actually shows women. Their women are the only ones driving the vehicles. And um, they show women strangely laying out um, flowers on top of her car, making a flower arrangement riding a horse beside her car. So these are the sorts of strange images where, um, as I indicated, they do show consumer culture, but it's mainly related to how a woman's life is improved because of it. So again, more direct, 
articles related to women, less to men, but if anything, related to the broader family and also children. Children are hugely important in this too. And so this is where I think um, it's the case where if you have the magazine distributed in Russia, then you're not just appealing to women, but also the children who are reading the magazine because their mothers are reading the magazine. For example, it also had sewing patterns for children as well. And I don't know about any of you, but I didn't really sew when I was six or seven or eight years old. Um, not at all. So I, so these are some things, but it, it goes to show that the women read the magazine and the kids read the magazine too. I hope that answers your question. It's an awesome question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do we have other questions? I have one more question. What's interesting for me as a political scientist, um, are there any, is there any data about the consequences for buying the magazines of both sides? Uh, interesting. Okay, so I don't have any statistics or consequences related to the USSR version in America. A great question, but again, this is where what what is available in the archives that I know is is not very significant in relation to USSR, unfortunately. Um, but in relation, and again, that could be the subject of a whole other article or book. But in relation to, well, I think I alluded to this earlier. The I I don't know of any specific consequences of buying America in Russia, but I do know that it was monitored very closely. Um, again, relegated mostly to urban centers. Um, and in fact, so much that, uh, for example, when they had their 1956 agreement to reissue America and then um, USSR and then later Soviet life would also be issued, uh, they did take great lengths to ensure that they now included subscription services that went to, for example, libraries where libraries could be monitored to see who actually took out the magazine. Um, they also uh, sent subscriptions out only to those people who were considered faithful, um, who were loyalists essentially to the communist regime. And, and essentially anybody, again, outside of urban centers, uh, Moscow, um, you know, for example, would have been you know, those areas would have been um, lesser in terms of who had access to the magazine and how many um, how many issues were sold at each newsstand. So again, I don't have exact statistics about this, so I do apologize for that. But it is to say that they took great lengths to or pains to ensure that it was monitored in urban centers, embassy officials or Moscow officials could see who bought these magazines and when, and there's evidence that, um, I mean, ordinary Russians who bought the magazine would sometimes be hesitant to give the magazine away to a friend or family member just in case they would be seemingly disloyal if they did so. So again, no exact statistics, so I do apologize for that, but it is to say that it was, it was very much monitored. There, there's no data on the US side about the USSR because we know some periods in America there was also really critical to reading something what was connected to socialism or communism. But I think maybe it was not so important for the American side. Or we don't have we don't know if it was so, so again, I guess like the subject of my book is America. And I do think, I do think, again, this could be a whole other book on the USSR, the magazine. I would love to do that at some point. Um, so I, that wasn't my main focus of research, but, but I absolutely agree with you. The US was not as concerned about the impact of USSR versus how concerned Russia was or the Soviet Union was about America magazine. And again, in fact, they thought, well, this is a boring, dreary, black and white magazine about work and labor. Um, and they they didn't show a tremendous amount of concern about it at all. Thank you. 
again, more work needs to be done in this area. And this is where I also, in my, the conclusion of my book, I, there's so many areas of focus. And I do think it could be in relation to, well, I focus mainly again on 1959 to 60, briefly 1970, when there was this issue on the feminist movement, a whole other book could be done on America from, you know, 1960 to 1994, or even a specific decade and the USSR magazine, because that would be absolutely fascinating. Never mind the exhibitions that took place um, in both countries during this time period. There's a lot to discuss. And unfortunately, the archives are not always um, conducive to doing this research. In fact, when I started doing my research, I met with um, a National Archives, um, a wall archivist at in Washington, who said that they were on the verge of throwing away these documents until he saved them. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if he was just saying this, but but it is to say that I think cultural diplomacy is not something that is well studied um, in comparison to military or economic power. Sadly. Thank you very much. If we don't have any more questions, I would like to say thank you for a really interesting presentation of the book and from Katarina and from Katarina and from you. And um, yes, thank you for joining us and staying with us. And uh, we will see each other uh, on um, February the 4th. Is it correct, Anna? The 4th one? The next seminar we have it on February the fourth. I just fifth, uh, fifth. Excuse me, fifth. Um, again, and uh, the video from today's seminar will be available soon on our YouTube channel.